welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us from he from <laughs> Hero... <laughs> From Hero Games, spelled with two E's. Eh, previously here f here with Beta Red, now coming back with Fast Action Hero, which the DM may or may not demand that you put the cookie down. The one and only R. Scott Oles. How you doing today, man? Or tonight, hey. Yeah, it's evening, right? And yeah, Wait. given the tra given the trailer and given the name, I had to make. I had to make the Arnie joke. <laughs> yeah. Put the cookie down. <laughs> oh. Nice. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's perfect. That's actually a perfect reference because this entire game is inspired by the movies that that he would appear in, the types of movies he would appear in. Yeah, and there's there have been people who've done ar now when it com when it comes to doing the action hero arc archetype um even even if this is called fa fast action hero is there is there a particular action movie era that you were leaning towards when you were concepting this yeah mostly the 80s and 90s um there's nothing wrong with the the action movies of today but the action movies that come out that have come out in the last like 10 years they always have a little bit of a different feel you know they're a little bit more real a little bit more intense the bad guys have motivations, and sometimes they play it so that you almost kind of feel for them a bit, you know. And um, if I'm being a bit I, honest, um, I know a lot of people extol the virtues of '80s action, but I feel like there's way too many gems in the '90s that get completely right. overlooked when everybody's Correct. talking talking about the '80s as this pit as this pinnacle. And I'm not dis I'm not dismissing the position that a lot of those movies from the 80s have earned. I'm just saying there's way too much stuff that people um, sleep on in the process. Correct. Yeah, so for me, it was the, the like 80s and 90s, right? Because I'm thinking... Because uh, for me, growing up, the action movies that I saw were not necessarily 80s movies. I mean, they were, but a lot of them were the movies that had come out during that time. So like movies that came out in 94, 96, mm -hmm. you know, 95, that kind of thing. So I'm thinking... Uh, not just like Arnold's 80s movies, but also his 90s movies and like Jean-Claude Van Damme's movies, Lethal Weapon, you know, all of those. And that's kind of what I thought of. In fact, my first playtest of the system, they uh, the people that came in, the playtesters had no idea what was going on, but they were, one was, it was called Buddy Cup. Hmm. One was a, I just what I named it uh, as this, just a test name, but one of them was a cop. One of them was like an Uber delivery kid that was, related to the cop and was on like a ride along to find out what it's like and one player was playing a bad guy or not a bad guy, a criminal character and they were supposed to the cops were supposed to go to the hotel to secure the criminal for testifying against like a mob boss or whatever and i did the whole like scene from lethal weapon 2 where like the bad guys attack the hotel and there's a whole fight and then somebody they bomb like a grenade blew up and people flew out the windows land in the pool that kind of thing mm -hmm. um so yeah, absolutely. Like '90s movies as well. This is what I was thinking. Yeah. You know that 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 style of action movie where you have an action hero who's just just you know doesn't care, doing whatever they can to like get the job done, and like bad guys who are just straight bad. Like they, they, you didn't need really their motivation. They're just stroking their cat in their evil chair while they put lasers on sharks, right? Yeah. Like <laughs> they're just bad. We don't know why. I do find it amusing that the rise of this type of movie came along with the what's considered the what's considered some of the darker periods of stalwarts like James Bond. I mean, the, yeah. I love, I loved, I loved a good amount of the '90s run with with Bond. I mean, I, I like Goldeneye. I enjoy, I enjoyed Tomorrow Never <laughs> Dies. I think I think Brosnan was the was the right guy for the job at that time. The eighties, however, was a very unfortunate time for fans of the character, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's nothing against the the actor. 
Um, guys, guys like Timothy Dalton are not the were not the wrong person to play the job. It's just they had no. A lot of things were changing a lot of fast, and they didn't know how to adapt. Mm -hmm. Um, but the if I, if I were to summarize the theme when it came to the action movies of the nineties, it will. The word that comes to mind is batshit. Right. Like right. just throw just throwing everything at the everything at the wall, no matter how ridiculous, and seeing what would um stick. And one of the perfect examples I give for this kind of thing is speed. Right. Exactly. Like that speed is, is a is a perfect example of that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh. Even even something like True Lies would be would probably be seen as a little bit too ridiculous for the eighties, but in that in that um insanity of throwing everything at the wall of the nineties would certainly fit. Mm hmm Oh. Mm hmm And of course even even with some of the stuff in the eighties, I as I've gotten older the the things that I find more interesting is the insanity that led up to the creation of certain works. I've told the story before about how the suit in RoboCop was an absolute nightmare to work with. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> it was. It weighs it weighs about 80, 80 or so pounds. Um, Peter Weller was being trained in mime with the suit on, and they were filming in Dallas in the summer. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard I've heard about the horrors that it was like yeah. making that film for him and for others. Well, the, well, to make things even worse, the stunt team was a brother and sister duo who midway through the thing were both going through divorces because <laughs> their spouses had ran off with each other. Ooh. <laughs> so bo I did not know that. That's a piece of knowledge I didn't have, yeah, but they hey. were they were it wasn't. They weren't getting to. They weren't. This wasn't some Lannister thing. They weren't married to each other. Sure. Right. Right. That. Right. The brother's wife ran off with the sister's husband. Yep. So they were going. They were both going through through the divorce proceedings at the same time, and obviously having to be in divorce courts with the same parties. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Which is a level of awkwardness I don't think is poss is possible to put on a scale. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a whole level of awkward for sure. Um, you had a similar you had similar bits of insanity with Terminator because putting as, putting aside the fact that originally, and I'm not sure if I'm not sure if you knew this, Cameron with Cameron had considered O.J. Simpson to play the Terminator. I I had not, but I did watch a bit where where Arnold talked about how he got the role essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah. Originally, and, Arnold was going to play yeah. Kyle Reese. Yep. And the reason why that didn't pan out was, one, the obvious, and two, in Cameron's words, he didn't think OJ looked like a killer. <laughs> <laughs> Which... Uh... Hind hindsight is a motherfucker with that. <laughs> and uh, I was like, he did as soon as I as soon as I heard that I I did a spit take and I was like I can think of 12 people that might agree with that statement. <laughs> <laughs> but but only 12. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but um there was also the fact that because that um because of a I've heard I've heard it was because of a miscommunication though mm -hmm. take it take this with a grain of salt. The Terminator skeleton was supposed to be made of um fiberglass with a with a chrome exterior you know look mm. me, look metallic but relatively easy to move since you're doing stop motion which is its own brand of hell mm -hmm. but for whatever reason the effects department didn't get the memo and they made the thing out of cast iron Ooh, even worse well let me make it even worse they were gorilla filming at night Ooh, yeah because Cameron at that time was in this awkward position where he where um he technically had experience his it, this was his it was his second film his first was Piranha 2 but that was under that was under the that was under Dion De Laurentiis's banner who is probably was probably the second biggest cheapskate in Hollywood around that time because Roger Corman is worse mm -hmm. 
and that and that's not hyperbole. There's way too even though Corman gave a lot of people their big break, he is infamously cheap. <laughs> but <laughs> there was but because of it because of a contract issue, it had to have an Italian credit as far as the director. Mm. So you, he either had no experience to, to people or he had some experience and it's terrible. <laughs> because Piranha 2 was one of those shitty jaws re- shitty jaws ripoffs. <laughs> right. But right. For a good amount of wa- for a good amount of time he was trying to get Arnold off of Terminator and then tr- and then trying to get him back on it to the point where one day he said to his roommate, "Hey, do I owe you money cuz I'm about to pick a fight with Conan?" <laughs> Is- Arnold had to be talked into it because he he didn't want to be typecast as playing villain roles, right? And that and I guess because of his size, that was something he was already he was always afraid of. Since this was well his second role, the first and obviously you had Conan the Barbarian, and before that, Hercules in New York, where he was dubbed over. Yeah, right. Because he had, I think he said from the interview thing I had seen, he'd only had like a hundred lines or something. In any film up to that point, mm-hmm. something like that, like 180 or something like that, which is cer- is certainly the case. And then the Terminator thing gets stranger because um, Harlan Ellison enters the picture, claiming that um, Cameron ripped off two of his stories. Right. Yep, I heard about that. Which doesn't surprise doesn't surprise me that Ellison would get would get involved because while Ellison is a brilliant writer, he was also a, he was also science fiction's grumpy old man, even when he was younger. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I would I wouldn't be. This is the this is the same guy who lost it, who lost the writing role for the first Star Trek movie because he cussed out the boss. <laughs> I mean, I I also heard uh, there was a a lady who came forward recently who said that she had actually written like terminator terminator 2 and matrix all at the same time and her, all of those were stolen from her i don't think anyone actually gave her credit but she was given some like 15 minutes of fame about it yeah because of, because of how complicated the writing the writing process in that wild west era was um, yeah do i do i do i believe 100 percent of the story uh, I, I don't know about that do I do I believe that she was that she was involved with the writing process? Yes. Yeah. It's just yeah. that uh, sure she was. Even even though even though a film may say that it was written by one person, that is rarely the case. You've mm-hmm. always got you've always got a bunch of writers passing stuff around and you've got a thick layer of leftover stuff on the cutting room floor. Mm-hmm. Also you have the actors demanding rewrites, directors demanding rewrites, like there's no way. Yeah. Yeah. Although it's better, it's better to demand rewrites than dem- than demand reshoots, like some right. like some productions these days. Because yep. a rewrite is going to be less expensive. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're still pay- mm-hmm. you're still paying the you're still paying the writer more, but um, it's but it's less moving parts than having to reshoot whole scenes. Mm-hmm. And then you know, on the fly, ad libbing that that they go actually that's better than what was written. So we're going to do that again. We're going to take that that take again we're not going to move anything we're going to get new people involved shoot we're just going to retake mm-hmm. yeah now as i understand it fast action hero is using a modify is using a slightly modified version of the black hack correct that is so, the correct assessment the obvious question would be what made you pick the black hack out of the numerous systems that are available to work with well, it has to do with the the speed in which the black hack can get the job done, right? I was trying to think so so one thing, right, when it comes to game design is thinking about how does the system do what you want? Like you could have a really great concept for a horror game or an action game or whatever, but then if you bog it down with a bunch of rules that don't necessarily get the feeling across of what you're trying to get, then you know, it it kind of disconnects. So, like, if you have to, if you have like an action-oriented game like this one, and you bog it down with uh, a bunch of rules for like combat situations that like slow everything down, well, then it's no longer like action-packed. Right now, it's just kind of a slow-moving, in our minds, theoretically action-packed game. And 
if um, if you're doing an action game, there's no point in do, in doing individual um individual ammunition tracking like you're do, like you're doing torchbearer or some shit. Correct, correct. Like as I, you know, I I've made the maximum apocalypse uh, system, which we're kind of calling the maximum engine mm -hmm. or something like that. The apocalypse engine, not the apocalypse engine, right? Because that's already taken. That, yep. uh, but we are we are moving toward releasing like that as a as a system just as an engine to be able to make other things or for fans to make other things but had that um and that does great for the the apocalypse setting even the few and cursed setting right which is still kind of apocalyptic because you have resource management as a key a aspect of it beta red is a little bit different and that system was was what i kind of worked with to make it sort of cyberpunky right where you have, like, whether you decide to shoot the guy or whether you decide to talk to the guy, those are both basically the same functions, and they do the same things. The outcomes are still kind of the same. Mm -hmm. um, you would you achieve overcoming the goal without with the way you wanted to. But in this case, I was thinking, like, how do I make it streamlined as possible? And I kind of, I kind of took a look at, at a couple of different action oriented games and things to like think what what did they do that that you know worked. And in the end, the black hack just kind of stood out to me as something that, if like, can be used for or generally used for these these quicker action type situations, right? Like you've got a very minimal amount of stuff you do in a combat, and it's like you move, you fight, you use an item, or you, you test the you know one of your attributes. Simple, and you don't you don't really track resources as much, right? You have there is a there is a method for tracking. Them, but it's a simplistic method that doesn't require a whole lot of thought um and you just you just move forward and i thought well okay that is kind of the feeling i want to go for i want a guy i want there to be like a bunch of bad guys walk into a room i narrate that they're shooting at you all of you guys do what you're going to do to get out of the way of those bullets and then do what you're going to do to stop these guys from shooting at you again and just keep it as quick and intense as possible to to focus on that over the top action feel of those those movies that i was trying to emulate mm -hmm. and that is that is a point that I that is very is a very good one to make, especially when there's there's a lot of designers I've seen that will take a certain concept and try and jam it into a system that they know, even if that system doesn't fit with what with what's um, being attempted. And yeah. I know people will say, "Oh, you oh you can just house rule to you can just house rule or homebrew to to make to make it fit." As I've said many times, house ruling should be a spice, not the main dish. Mm -hmm. Correct. And I don't know about you, but I don't. I, I'll put a, I'll put a little bit of pep. I'll put a little bit of pepper or or butter when I have mashed potatoes. I'm not putting a whole stick in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I I kind of like look at home brewing, right? Like that's that's how game designing starts for most people who are designers at this point mm -hmm. you kind of you you, you homebrew something uh, because you want it to work a little differently the next step beyond that into actually designing is to go okay well now that i've homebrewed these special rules for the situation what do i cut off that doesn't work and now you're creating a whole different system and at that point you you can go back and go okay well does this system even work for what i want yeah um home, homebrewing is great for custom classes, custom weapons, custom situations, but overall the core system is still the same, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're if you get into the point where you're changing up the entire core system and how it works, then you're no longer homebrewing; you're making your own game. Um, the analogy I often use for 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 some is to consider how Bethesda Bethesda's um, output gets a whole gets mocked relentlessly. Rightfully so, for the mm -hmm. fact that you need to put in a bunch of mods in order to make things work. Mm -hmm. And I think I think I think some some I think when it comes to over homebrewing with t with TTRPGs, I think that should that that should be pointed out just as much. I mean, you yeah. homebrewing is inevitable, but at the very mm -hmm. at the very least, um, make it easier on yourself. Like if I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna try and force say, a, say A D and D to to run, um, a a cyberpunk campaign, right? Because uh, people have tried. Oh, people have tried. Oh yes, 
Um, whether or not they've succeed, whether or not they've succeeded, given the sheer amount of stuff that you'd have to make out of whole cloth, mm -hmm. you end up crossing that threshold between um, just just making a few tweaks here and there to have it fit, as like say convert, like say doing standard fantasy, then doing something like Spelljammer. And mm -hmm. then you ha and then you have you're blowing the whole thing up and st and and um trying to and it barely resembles the or the original rule set, which yeah. in all fairness, if somebody does that, they are in good company. That's that's how Rollmaster got started. Yeah, it was a collection that's... of house rules that just expanded to the to the point it became its own game. Right. And that's that's kind of what I mean by like that's where like it starts, right? You you start homebrewing, and if you get to a point where you've homebrewed beyond what normally works, you've you've essentially created your own game. Yeah. And then you just have to go and look at how does my what is my core loop, right? What am I, what are the characters doing over and over again? That's going to be the focus of what everything should build off of. And then at that point, you're you're starting your own new system and go with it. You know, just roll with it and see where it goes. Mm -hmm. Um. And so for this, like, that's kind of, that was like, f the Black Hacks core system works. It works for how I want. So now I just need to make modifications to make it fit the genre because it works the way that I want it to. Now, if I was trying to do something else with the game, then I wouldn't have used the Black Hack as, like, the base for how I went forward, you know? Mm -hmm. Um. But I, it, but it did. It did exactly what I wanted. Because if you've seen some of the Black Hat games, uh, the, some of the hack games that are based off of it, some of them do a similar thing. Like the Mech Mecha Hack does a great job of doing the same thing. It's okay. action oriented. You're in a mech. You're blowing stuff up with missiles that are firing out of your shoulder. Mm -hmm. All we need to do is go roll your power and see how well you do. You know, <laughs> and that's it. And we move on from you blasted him. You blasted the the other mech or the star base or whatever for 3d6 damage and that's the damage now we go to the next guy what do you do you know mm -hmm. and so that was what that's what made me think you know that that's that works for what i want i want it to be fast i want it to be loose i want it to be like well i'm gonna jump from this car to the other car cool do it you know and if it's cool enough let's just let's just forget the role and just have you do it just leap from one car to the other car that's cool you know Screw it. It's an action movie. We don't need to talk about the physics of whether or not you could, while driving down a highway at 60 miles an hour, leap from your convertible onto the top of a car that's slightly taller. You know, like, we don't need to do that. We don't need to worry about that. Yeah. Just jump. <laughs> now, and I will, I will note that one of the mantras that I have in the temple is believability over realism. To put it another way, you remember you remember the tagline that was on the poster for the original Superman movie? Uh, I don't. I might. I don't People think I ever saw the that original. a man can fly. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. The idea, the idea being, um, if you're the idea, the the idea of realism in that it is often used in a very reductionist manner. Mm -hmm. As long as as long as the craziness that you're seeing is consistent within the story that's being told, it's not going to be that big of a deal. Yeah. Yes, gun nuts will probably get will probably get annoyed mm -hmm. at how at how no movie seems to be able to figure out how su how suppressors actually work. <laughs> but yep. as long as it works within the as long as it as long as it's making the sound that is going to be consistent within that film. Um, right. People aren't going to have too much of an issue. Right. Uh, now moving pa moving past that, given the whole archetype and role thing, which is pretty, t which is fairly typical of Black Hack, mm -hmm. I'd like to I'd like to play a little bit of, I guess I guess word association though character association might be better. Um. Mm -hmm. I'm going to I'm going to list off the ar the archetypes that you brought up on the quick start, and yep. I'd like you to give me a ca a character from any action movie that comes to mind. It doesn't even have to be '80s or '90s. It can be any action movie. Period. Okay. Uh, think of it as a really really bad Rorschach test. I'm going to do the same thing. With <laughs> okay. Okay. But I can't call it a Rorschach test because 
I'm because I'm not licensed, and also I'm not making a bunch of ink blots for one bit. <laughs> fair, fair. Oh, uh, but jokester. Oh, um, I could think of the okay. Uh, bu- 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 Joe Pesci's character from Lethal Weapon. I forget right. his name. I'd say most of Joe Pesci's characters, period. <laughs> basically, basically. Um, Martyr. Uh, let's see, Martyr. Um, oh, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger's character in Last Action Hero. It's kind oh. of a martyr. All right. Maverick. You can't say, Ma- you can't say Maverick from Top Gun. Oh, That's damn. Crazy. Uh, let's see. There, I can think of. Um, I can't. I can't remember the character's name. So there's a there's a, a Korean film that I'm thinking of. Um, I forget the character's name, but anyway, he's a detective, and yeah, he's he's basically trying to find the guys who robbed an armored car, and he's not just alone. He's trying to get everyone on his team to figure it out, mm-hmm. right? And he's he's relentless at like going after them. Um, Paragon. <sighs> Paragon. Let's see. A action movie. Action movie. Action movie. Um. Oh, uh, Chuck Norris in the Delta, the Delta Force movies. All right. Rogue. So that's the the okay. I. Oh. Uh. Probably. Um. Son of a... I can't remember the actress's name from... the uh, Michelle from... The, the, the actress from all of the Fast and Furious movies. All right. R- Michelle Rodriguez. That's her yeah. name. Yep. Um, rookie. Oh, uh, you know, in Training Day? Mm. The... Perfect. Or even... Um, even actually, like, a lot of the buddy cop films. There's always one. Like, the rookie, right? Mm. Who's usually the, the, new, the new partner. Yeah. Um, or... Um, uh, can't think of his name. All of a sudden, the character's name, the orc from uh, Bright. The orc from what? From Bright. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. I know who you're talking about. And Bright got a lot more shit than it deserved. That movie. Oh yeah, movie. it's actually a pretty decent movie. Especially, especially since I was able to use that movie to help bring people into um, Shadowrun. Oh yeah, if you didn't use that movie to bring people in Shadowrun, you're not movie- using them correctly. <laughs> tough oh that's just that's easy that's just like dom from fast and furious easy but also any any of jason statham's characters um before before the, before the family memes took over yeah before the family memes took over yeah um you know just just the guy who oh uh, or even um well yeah yeah so fast and furious uh but yeah no any any of the 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 guys in action movies that just take hits for some reason. They just do. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, veteran. That, okay. So easy. Um, that's, uh, 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 fuck from Lisa Levin. Uh, uh, Danny Glover's character, Donald yeah. Glover's or Danny. Yeah. yeah Mr. Donald two, Glover's Mr. character. Two days away from retirement. Two days away from retirement, guy. Yeah, I can't think of his character's name. I can Murta and uh, oh, it's Murta, Riggs. right? Briggs. Riggs, Riggs, yes, Riggs, mm-hmm. Riggs, yeah. Oh, um, I don't... most of the, most Sorry. of these I'd say are pr- are pretty um are pretty are pretty self explan are pretty self explanatory. The the one that I'm I'm curious what it's what what that archetype is supposed to represent is Paragon. So I was going with the idea of the the skilled leader, the 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 thinking cop kind of feel, right? Um, not necessarily a cop, but like the one the one character who often is like the better leader and is like good at their job, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so much so that maybe even they don't listen to their higher ups because they're better. Uh, that, that the job than them they're just so good but they're but they also aren't just the the ones like the the mavericks who are really good but kind of on their own right mm-hmm. um more of the they're really good at their job and they want everyone else to do good at their job 
So, so for whatever reason, I was thinking of Dread. Yeah, Dread might be a Paragon. He is truly a really good tactician. He's really good at like doing his job. He's the best. Um, and he's kind of a dick, right? But when, if if you listen to him, like both dreads, right? You, uh, uh, Carl Urban's dread and and Stallone's dread, both of them dicks to some extent, but also, you know, those those judges that listen to them or follow them uh, do better at their job because they're, they're just they're that they're they're the perfect example of what they need to be. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I'd. S- I'd say, um, I forget. I'd say the the colonel in Rambo in Rambo would mm-hmm. apply just as much. Yep, I would agree with that. But now, now, obviously, I'd like obviously I'd like to continue this word association thing with the roles, and there there's only five roles, and I th- I think this one would be is going to be a little bit easier than archetype. So I'll start with cop. Uh, okay. Um, well, back to Schwarzenegger. Um, but also the um so Schwarzenegger in Kindergarten Cop and in you know, just a lot of them. But um also like basically both both Stallone and um uh Kurt Russell in Tango and Cash. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, probably more, probably more. Cur- well, that, see, they're both cops, but see, this is where those archetypes come in because they would be, they'd both fit the cop category as far as their abilities and stuff and the way they work, but then they'd have different archetypes, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, criminal. Uh, the, so, yeah, that would be basically everyone from Fast and the Furious. Um, I kind of feel like. John Wick kind of fits in that category a little bit more than he does as a cop. Um, not just because of his association as an assassin, but but because of his like the way that he would do things. Like he the ambush thing that you get as a criminal sort of fits that category in my head. Yeah. Um criminal. Wait, we already did that one. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I, think, <laughs> I think I got crosswired for a second. Um Hustler. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, that one's a little bit more open because that's a pretty open style. Um, but like um, um, Samuel Jackson's character in uh, Die Hard uh, Three, right? He's he would be in the hustler category. Um, also, let's see who else would fit in the hustler category. Uh, oh, um, from Bloodsport. Uh, big dude from who played Ogre in the Return of or the uh, Revenge of the Nerds. Mm-hmm. Um, he's he's more of a hustle character. He's just outgoing and connected, um, but still gets himself involved in stuff. Um, he's more of the the sidekick, as it were, that in some to some extent. Yeah. Um, Danny Ocean also comes to mind. Yep, perfect. Uh, mentor. Uh, yeah, that one was a little bit, a little bit more fun to play around with because that I stretched Egg Shen from Big Trouble in Little China, um, a couple of characters who are, are more like bit characters in like um, some of the the karate movies and stuff. Um, Mr. Miyagi falls in that category for sure. Um, yeah, I'll give that. That'll be a pretty good association. Mm-hmm. Um, specialist. So that one, this one, uh, let's see. How do I associate that with a lot of characters? Um, usually they're, they're utility characters, right? So they're going to be um, uh, like, like M from, or not M, uh, uh, Q from James Bond. Um, uh, also, Egg Shen would fall into that category too. But the, the tech guys in all the movies, the, the, the guy in the elevator would fall into that category too. Um. Yeah. Um, so if, if when you when you say the when you say the tech guys, obviously, I can't help but think of Q. Right. Uh, or or just any, just anybody who is is on um, focus in a particular field. It doesn't necessarily have to be tech. It could it could yeah. It could it could be any sort of um well specialized area. Yeah. 
Yep. Now they they do have forensics and medical kits as like their starting things, but that doesn't mean that that's what they are, right? Um, and I and I believe in in the rules, I do sort of lay out the idea that that you have you create your persona, and I put it. I even put an example. So in the main rules, I put um, a specialist could be a local bartender, a Taoist fortune teller, or a clever journalist, right? Those all fit. So like in Big Trouble Little China, I know I said. Um, like Egg Shen to some extent, but also um, Kim Cattrall's character would fit into that category. Mm. Right? Very good at a particular thing, and that thing helps support the overall story. Mm -hmm. Now, I did come. I did come to realize that if that if somebody wants a a perfect place to just steal to just steal a bunch of little ideas for a future camp campaign. Um, something like leverage provides an ideal framing mm -hmm. device because mm -hmm. the th obviously with action movies action movie stories are one and dones but it'd be and be a bit yep. tricky to do a longer campaign ba based on action movies but if you're building it around some sort of group that is take that is taking all manner of jobs mm -hmm. whether it be a whether it be a team whether it be whether it be let would be um, leverage whether it be um any f even the expendables to a certain to a certain extent or mm -hmm. the ro or the rotating crews that were in mission impossible you kind of you kind of have a framing device for that yeah oh. yeah um that's exactly right and like even when you look at the action movies um uh, some of the good ones have these different kinds of characters. Um, so you, even if you go, oh, well, it's really, it's all about, you know, Schwarzenegger taking on the Predator. Well, yeah, but there were other characters doing other things along the way that brought that story together. You can't ignore that. Um, and you also think about things like, Leverage is a perfect example of the kind of stuff that you could do with this. Um, the oceans movies, while it's they're they're generally aimed at heisting, you can still have this crew of people who are like each session or each like story arc, they're given a thing to do, and it takes time to get it done, mm -hmm. and they all need to use their skills to come into play to get it done. Yeah. Um, and that's also the reason I br I brought up leverage. Uh, I could also bring up um, burn notice, which I loved mm -hmm. during its run. And that one leans into that one flirts with spy fiction, especially, and goes headfirst in it in the later seasons. But with that, with that one, you you essentially have people vastly overqualified doing odd jobs because they don't have much of a choice. Right. I mean, the concept of a burn, of a burn notice is ba is basically when when some when some sort of notification is given out that that a given spy is unreliable. Mm -hmm. And well, with with Sam, the pre the premise in that show was all his accounts were all his accounts were frozen. He's constantly monitored. He's in the he's in the middle of Miami. He's get all he can do is is scrape by with any contact that the, that's even willing to still talk with him. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> and each of the each of the other members that he, of that crew that he does talk with have some sort of baggage. Yep. Like you have Bruce Campbell's character being somebody who used to, inf who used to um, inform on him to hit to his own higher ups. One one of the other characters was hit was his ex when he was, be when he was being a spy in the um, IRA, mm -hmm. which makes th which makes things a bit awkward. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So you have, it's it's important to have some sort of framing device, and I'm, even though this is a zine, I'm guessing there's a few story seeds that you're going to be putting into the full book. Yeah. Um, so in the, in the book itself, I actually leave it kind of open mm -hmm. um, for what you want to do. So in the GM section, there's seeds, right? Like as you were saying, so there's um, stuff about setting creation. And I, I like, if you think about just the plethora of over the top movies that came out, in that time from we're talking about 80s 90s early 2000s um it, it doesn't matter like it could be it could be yojimbo style it could be um like 
the raid like the i list i I list a couple of movies where it's like they just remade them in different settings right like the raid and dread um like the raid redemption and dread are basically the same movie Uh, different there's lots of differences and so both of them are absolutely qualified by themselves but there's a lot of similarities between them Mm -hmm. and they take place in different times in different settings but you know like yojimbo is a great example yojimbo by kurosawa love that film love it great film i watch it sometimes just to just to relax you know just a great film and it's been remade a couple of different times and like it was made in the like last man standing with bruce willis right Mm -hmm. it moved from samurai japan to prohibition era america and yet still works (laughs) because the core is still there and so there's this section about like the different genres you can you can play this in, and then I have a like even a, a D10 sort of generator to help you figure out this cyberpunk setting versus a crime boss who you know, and they have to handle a, a hostage situation. Mm-hmm. You know, go for it. Yeah, and I I know I know some might su- some might suggest well what what if what if the what if they wanted to do um fan wanted to do fantasy with it um and I'm like. You could, you could, but there, but there's, pl- but there's way too much stuff. There's way too much of a fantasy leaning with the black hack, anyways. Yeah. So, so. Yeah, the, if you wanted to, um, I would say, yeah, go ahead and pick up the black hack and do it that way. Oh. It'd be a lot easier on you, I think. Mm-hmm. But if some, if somebody wanted to do some, truth be told, is if somebody said, can can we use this but fantasy, I'd say. All right, I want I want you to go and I want you to go and watch um, Constantine. Mm-hmm. And like we're doing that, <laughs> you know, either either Constantine or any of those any of those modern those modern mythos um, films and shows that were all over the place in the nineties and two thousands. Mm-hmm. Uh, Constantine's just the main one I go with because well, well, I like the character and it's and his setup certainly fits, you know. The the guy who's good at his job is just that everybody can't stand him, right? Because, well, he's kind of he's kind of King Dick, <laughs> right? Right. Um, especially Papa Midnight, who would ra- who would rather sh- who would rather shoot him and be done with it if he had the chance. Hmm. Uh. But yeah, I mean, you easily could do like if if you. If you want to do fantasy i would go okay well maybe the black egg works better for you um but i know that if you try to you know go in homebrew the black egg to make it modern or even futuristic you're going to run into some trouble hence this is where i come in right where i go well try this one because lockout and escape from new york great films both of them are fairly similar and they both sort of fit this kind of genre where you have a group of people trying to deal with something and they have to do it quickly with a lot of action sequences. Um, but one's in space and one's in dystopian future, right? Like they're different and yet they work because the framework is still the same. Plus well, just, just because this is built on action movies doesn't mean we have to do, doesn't mean you have to do um, the same level of, re- of quote unquote realism. Right. I know that there were those ground those grounded action movies or at least they claimed to be grounded in the 2000s but mm-hmm. they were but they weren't really not as much as they like to not as much as some people like to think they were. Yeah. Um which does lead me to, does lead me to a bit of a dumb question but if somebody wanted to do an XP of say Jason Bourne which archetype and and role would you suggest? Ooh, that's actually a good question. It's a pretty deep question. Jason Bourne. <sighs> yeah, because there's a there's a couple of things at play in him, right? He fits he fits probably a couple of archetypes. Um, hmm. I would I wouldn't I wouldn't say that he fit. There's a few that he doesn't fit. Um. Definitely not he doesn't. Maverick. Definitely does not fit the Maverick character. Um, he definitely doesn't really fit the Jokester character either. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would throw those out. But um, and and not so much a rookie either, right? Because while he doesn't remember a lot, he doesn't. He he isn't just like 
like going, I don't know what I'm doing. Well, I guess I'll just tag along, right? He's not that guy either. Um, so I put him probably. He probably falls into the maybe the martyr category or um, Paragon Paragon category um, because he's that kind. I would put him between one of those two, probably. I think. Mm -hmm. And as as far as role, would you go? Would you pick? Would you put him in specialist? I think I would. Um, because because here's the other side to this system, um, and this was discovered by one of my players in our actual play that we're doing with the Kickstarter. So one of the the players is playing a um, he's playing a mentor character, and he the mentor character is supposed to be the one who kind of helps lead the group a bit, the one who sort of cheers on the allies and stuff. But and I think he was originally intending to do that, but he discovered that because of the stats, because the game is based on you you roll under a stat, he discovered that he actually is pretty accomplished at doing certain actions that would seem outside of that role of being the mentor, right? Like, mm -hmm. he's done, in the two episodes we've had, he's done each each episode, he's had a scene where he just decided to, to run, to, to move twice as his turn. And he makes a spirit die roll, which, which is our sort of action economy thing the spirit die works in a way to like like the usage die where it's like you can only do these special actions so many times before eventually you can't anymore right um and we just mitigate that by having the spirit die roll now the higher the spirit die because you have to roll a one or two the higher the spirit die the less likely you are and in his case he has a really high spirit die because he's a mentor and then he decided to like enhance his mentorness with by increasing his spirit die he also uh frequently tries to use one-liners to get that added benefit of use a one line or you get some kind of boost you know mm -hmm. um but anyway so he runs twice and he makes the roll and he always is fine so he can do this so he runs a long distance bullets are flying around him he gets to where he needs to be and then he's like i'm just gonna try something weird and he's done things like throw nachos in somebody's face to distract them and, and take them down um and do all kinds of stuff so i i it doesn't just because you're a specialist doesn't mean you can't you know, ninja kick a guy in through a window. It doesn't mean that that doesn't happen. It's just that, like, the core of your existence for the group is to help them understand things and know things and get through situations. Because you can make roles on their behalf. Like, you can make a spirit die roll for your, like instead of them. Um, you can help them heal. So yeah, I could I could see that being the thing where he's doing where Jason Bourne would be doing these action things, but at his core, that's not necessarily what he's intending. Like what he's wanting to do, he's not out there being like, "I'm gonna kick this guy in the face." You know, he's not that guy. Um, no, Bo the way he's the way he's presented, especially in the especially in the second movie, which I consider the best of the three. Mm -hmm. Um, he is very, 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 very precise. He's going if he's going into a particular area, he has a he has a plan he has a plan mapped out to yeah. get to get in, do what he needs to, and get and get out. Mm -hmm. I think one of the, one of the best representations of that is the is the phone call scene, which is actually one of my one of my favorite bits of flexes. Since the whole time the the whole time the FBI is it um is setting up the the plans to try and track him, then the, then at the at the same time you have him um tr scoping out the place where they where they're at, calling them, um using was what's likely a burner phone um setting up a place in time and and ending the call just enough just enough t with just enough time to spare that they didn't have enough time to triangulate where he was and that whole if i can't what if i can't find her she's standing right next to you as a flex go of the whole if i wanted to shoot you you'd already be dead <laughs> yeah <laughs> um. yeah that's that's a perfect paragon situation for sure mm -hmm. yeah and the th and of course and of course when you have her looking out of the window he's already gone right and again that whole get in do what do what needs do what needs to be done and then get out sometimes things yep. get get ugly but th but the idea is don't stay don't stay too long because i'm not supposed to be here and to me that 
even if it even if it isn't the specialist in the way a lot of people would think that it carries that same energy mm -hmm. and for sure in the same vein as we were discussing i also realized when it comes to making combat scenes like action scenes there is one scene that i th and i may maybe you've brought this up to your players that is wor that is worth considering looking back at and studying and that is the tea house scene in Hard Boiled. Mm -hmm. Which I know that the designers of the game Fear um, referenced that when it came to the type of shootouts that they wanted. Right. If you go back and look at that movie, it's not a case where there's a where there's a few bullet dents in the walls or anything like that. No, the whole place is getting trashed. Right. You know, gla glasses gl glasses going everywhere. Um. Um. Bo not not bottles, but um, but ket kettles and the like are just getting absolutely destro absolutely destroyed, and shards of that mm -hmm. is going all mm -hmm. over the all over the place. The <laughs> the whole thing looks like a mess. Oh. And of course, just curious, but have you ever mm. read blowing up the movies? I have not read that, but um. That sounds like something I should probably read, but yes, no, I have not. Um, um, Blowing up the movies was a book by Robin Laws, the same guy behind Feng Shui, which yeah, is kind of yeah, an earlier yeah. adopter of the kind of thing you're dipping into with Fast Action Hero. Yeah, where he yeah, I have about, I have Feng Shui. Yeah, he he talks he talks about what what you can learn as far as setting up action scenes by referencing various action movies. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always a reference I br I bring up to people whenever they want to find ways to spice up um, combat. Oh, because the last thing you the last thing you want is for somebody to have the I hit, I shoot him with my gun kind of thing. Right. And with that with that in mind, the um now the quick start was on was only thirty one pages. Are are you shooting for like forty five to fifty for the um, full book. That's correct. So the full book will be forty-four pages, and and the reason I determined it was forty pages is not because of its like the complexity of the information. It's because uh, that's the maximum amount that I can print as a zine without it without the cutter screwing it up. <laughs> True story. Um, so I do actually have a second book uh, that I plan with the Kickstarter. If you've seen the the page with the pre-made adventures. So instead of loading it with pre-made adventures in the main book, it's a separate book. Um, and that has a bunch of sort of pre-made, pre-made, not full adventures. Um, they're the kind of like the template adventures or not templates. There's a word like adventure recipes as a word. It's got the description of what's happening in the adventure, um, a, a couple of tables for determining like objectives and twists. And then, like three scenes, the opening, the mid scene, and the, like the climax scene, um, descriptor and, and like the types of actions that you can do in them. So they're more like a recipe for creating the adventure. But even if you were just to kind of go, okay, there's a, they're just going to transition from this scene to that scene. You can still work through it without doing a whole lot of prep. Um, but if you wanted to develop it into like a full written out thing, you could easily do that too. I just gave you the template to go forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can certainly get that. But yeah, so forty-four pages total for the book. Mm -hmm. um, but... Yeah, because little in fact, if it gets longer than that, the it can't. It's it's not so much a zine anymore. Um, you have to change up the style of printing, and then then it won't get damaged. Uh, if anyone has seen the beta red copies, all of them had damaged corners, and that's the reason for that. I made it too. I made it too fat, and they, the cutter couldn't cut it properly. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. I know I I know I know the fe I know the feeling when it comes to mess when it comes to messing around with with cutters when I try when I tried binding my own damn book. Mm -hmm. uh, Cuz you think you think you got everything right and then the, then one little thing's off and the whole thing goes tits up. Yep. So the there's a, a little known thing about the like zine unless you make it yourself and you know physically put it together yourself. And can figure out how to adjust things for the size of what you're doing. The printers will cut your book wrong 
if it's too thick or shaped too weirdly. Yeah. So. Which, which makes it something. It sometimes makes me wonder why some people want to print their books in la in landscape format when that's going to be sticking out like a sore thumb when the, when it goes on the shelf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a there's a lot to like little things like that that go into game design that like no one really knows until you've actually reached that point. Mm -hmm. um, but deciding the size and shape of your book um, is not the first thing you should decide. No, first thing you should work on is the rules. Like, how do they work? Do they actually work? Um, and then once you get the rules down, then you have to think about okay, how am I gonna? What am I gonna write about in the book? Am I gonna write? Is it gonna be ninety percent setting book with like a chapter on rules, or is it gonna be? A, a book on rules with very with no setting or how am i going to do this but when you get to the point where you're getting ready to print it you have to think about its size and you you do and so you, you just have to consider how how tall is this book um everyone just kind of you know a lot of times you get the newer designers who just go with like oh the typical size you know eight and a half by eight. but that that works as far as your making of the pages but then you have the cover to consider, and then you may end up making this book that's just slightly too tall to fit on everyone's shelf or stands out over everyone else's book because your cover is now a lot bigger than you thought it was going to be. When it comes to um, when it comes to books that are already out that I, that are that are my whipping boy when it comes to how they were printed, first edition Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay is my whipping boy because I have to put it on very specific shelves or it won't fit unless I put it in sideways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a few that's still like um there's there's other things too like the size of font comes into play. Mm -hmm. Um this was actually a thing like I I loved the coyote book, right? I love the book. I love the the system is pretty good. Um like the book is good as far as art goes and and the way that they did it. It's real well put together. It's got a sleek cover. Um but when they i don't think any of them really realized the font size i like i still don't know if they intentionally made the font size so big but it's really big font and so the book is 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 like 500 pages and it, it feels like it didn't need to be not just because there were sections where they repeated themselves which could easily have been cut out and that's just a that's just like a first time game designer mistake um where you don't have to repeat yourself everyone gets it you know just reference what you've mentioned before um but the the font is really big, mm -hmm. and it's like I think that if they had cut the font out, or they just sh short, just make this font a little smaller. Like it looks great in PDF, right? When you're reading on a computer screen, the font is great, but when you actually have it on a physical page, it's pretty big. And if you if they were to shrink the font, well, then they would probably have dropped a hundred pages off the book's total size. I mean, my yeah. thoughts. Yeah, though. So, um... I've had I've had some critiques when it came to Coyote and Crow, but that's a whole other matter. That's a whole different matter. Yeah, yeah. That, we could talk about that at a different time and place. But, um, um, but but you know, on the topic of creating the gazine. Mm -hmm. So for this, I I have the fonts set at their size, which um, which are eleven. Uh, it's that's where I put the font, but it's also um a type of font that is a little bit smaller so it it feels like when you're when i'm writing like when i'm putting it together whoops, sorry when i'm putting it together in the the um the system to be to to, to the word processor as it were um it looks like it sh it's like wrong but when i did the test prints it looks perfect like it looks exactly the way that i intended it to mm-hmm now, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? I imagine the turnaround time isn't going to be as as large as some others because it's a, because well, Zine and Beta Red mm -hmm. didn't have a very long turnaround. No, well, there's there's two factors that come into play with turnaround, um, and I've I have them both under control. So I expect that I, I put the release date or the delivery date for everything as November only to give myself time. I think I'll be done well before that, and they'll be out in August, you know, September, the latest, I think. Because um, the book is, is done. I'm looking at it right now. The, aside from a few minor changes here or there, and, you know, making sure that I have the updated, like, page reference numbers for various places, um, it's, it's done. And 
so I as soon as like Kickstarter's over, there's the like, two week like delay time that you have to wait for while Kickstarter clears everyone's credit cards and stuff. But in, even in that time, I can start sending it off to print. Um, but I just want to. I'd probably want to go over it a couple more times, like editing and stuff with with yeah. people, and then and then release it. So, but I, I have a, a strong feeling it'll be August when I send it out. Uh, much like Beta Red, where I did the same thing. I think it was October. It was delivered to everyone. Mm-hmm. It was when everyone had it for sure. It was the end of October, and I did. It was the same thing I did in February. Yeah, I so, can, I can I can certainly get that. Yeah, so zines are much easier to print than like full books for sure. Um, but then also, who you choose to go with as your printer. Um, Choosing a printer in the same country that you're in is usually the best choice because, especially with zines, right? The production value isn't so great that you need to go off, like, off to China and have them print it for you because it's not, you're not doing anything super crazy. Um, I mean, maybe you are. Maybe you're creating some kind of super crazy zine, in which case, maybe you do have to go overseas to, like, get it working out for you. I, f- I feel like that'd be redundant. It really would, wouldn't it? Like, it's a zine, but. You know, you know, it'd be it'd be like it'd be like having a um, it'd be it'd be like it'd be like having a a fat a fat free bar of lard. Right, right. I mean the the you know the whole idea behind zines is to kind of print them yourself, right? Mm-hmm. And the only reason I don't print these myself is because I don't have printers. Right, I don't have a printer. I don't have stapler big enough for this kind of production i don't have the ability to make this kind of production on my own Mm -hmm. in my house but i could i could if i wanted to it wouldn't be that hard um or i could go send it off to one of the printers here in the u.s that does this sort of thing and i have a two-week turnaround actually the uh, quick the the test prints i did i sent it off to them and i had it in 10 days like the the test prints came back to me in 10 days Mm -hmm. so yeah, so that's where I'm at. Mm. Um, so yeah, the turnaround will be really quick. Yeah. So with but with that said, I I'm certainly gonna be looking forward to seeing how it turns out and what sort of craziness people come up to come up to with it. Uh, but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. And. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Thanks. I love coming here, actually. It's fun. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!